Amen. Well, for those that are visiting, we've been studying 2 Samuel for the past few weeks. And, uh, and yet I, I wanted to be able to get kind of a time-appropriate title for our message. So there we're going to be focused in mostly on chapters 13 and 14 of 2 Samuel. We need to start in Luke chapter 2. Beginning in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men, on whom his favor rests. Now, that was a cranky evening. Amen, guys? You know, we, we had such a great time. Uh, of course, uh, Elena, my wife, is Cuban. And uh, in, the, in Latin culture, a lot of times, they, they celebrate Christmas a little bit more uh, on Christmas Eve. And it's called Noche Buena, the good night. And trust me, we had a good night. Uh, Elena fixed her pot roast and the black beans and rice. And, and I mean, it was just a cranking time. We had two different pies, pecan pie and chocolate cream pie. And I set aside my diet for a few hours right there. And, uh, of course, I, I, I got humbled in the Lord then the next day because my, my, my son gave me a belt. And I looked at the uh, waistline on that thing. I go, so you think I'm that big, huh, you know? He gave me a 38. <laughs> I'm going, but I'm happy to say there is a little extra room right there. Amen, amen. So, anyway, that's just how it is. The Lord bless us. And then he humbles you a little bit right there. But right here, right here we have an incredible, incredible evening. And it's shouted from above, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now, a lot of times we see little phrases like that on our Christmas cards. And yet this was not just a Christmas card, guys. This is the word of God proclaimed from the heavens, by the heavenly hosts. And God promises peace on earth. Now that's pretty exciting. You know, if there's one thing men and women are looking for during the Christmas holidays, it's peace. And yet the Bible makes a condition right here. He says, and on earth, peace to men, on whom his favor rests. The title of the lesson today, Peace on Whom His Favor Rests. Let's look at the protagonist of 2 Samuel, our hero, but our fallen hero at the moment, David. For certainly if there is anybody the Lord favored, it was our brother David. I mean, after all, he was called a man after God's own heart. 2 Samuel Let's pick up the reading in chapter 12. Remember the intense confrontation that Nathan gives to David about David's sin. David's sin had lied unconfronted for about a year. And finally, the prophet Nathan decides it is time. The child of adultery has been born. And so Nathan tells a story, and in this story, he convicts David about it. And David is very upset about the individual in the story that had sinned against the poor man with the one little ewe lamb. And the Bible says in verse 7, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. 
I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what's evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret. But I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, You have made enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you will die. I mean, right here, we find David, a man on whom God's favor rested, totally without peace. Why was this peace stolen from him? Because sin destroys peace. Sin destroys peace. What is the impact? What is the consequence of our sin? Well, number one, there's separation from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Number two, it produces guilt before God and guilty feelings. Now, guilt is a factual state. Feelings can be there or not. Sometimes we can be guilty, we can sin, and not have guilty feelings. Or other times, we can not sin and have guilty feelings. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the impact of sin is, number one, separation from God. Number two, you are guilty before God and you have guilty feelings. Number three, there is misery and emptiness. Number four. Sin is never something that's contained within your own being. There is destruction and disunity in relationships that you're a part of. So what do you mean? Well, I don't know. Did did any of you guys see the game yesterday of Miami and the Lakers and everything? I mean, mean, it was a a pretty cranking game, I have to admit. Uh, I was rooting slightly for Miami because I love Shaq and Kobe's kind of hurting right now. But, uh, you know, all the way through this, if you don't know the situation with the Lakers, I mean, the last few years, they've been the dominant team in the NBA. I mean, Kobe and Shaq, a great one-two punch. And they, they were cranking, but, but they just got attitudes and sins towards each other. And it came to a point where the, the people in the Lakers said, we've got to separate these guys. So they sent Shaq away. And, you know, so the whole television time just kind of milks us the whole time during the whole show. I mean, first of all, they start playing the song, showing the old videos of Shaq and Kobe playing together. Why can't we be friends? They're playing that song. <laughs> then, and, and, then they're showing some more great dunks and assists and everything, and they play Memories. And then another advertisement, you're seeing some other, they got the arm around each other, just loving up on each other. The way we were starts playing. <laughs> and then we look at it from a sports point of view, we go, this is so stupid. You know, from one point of view, all sin is stupid. Because all sin destroys relationships. I mean, it hurt to watch how they greeted, or should I say, did not greet each other at midcourt. I mean, here are two guys that have done so much, and yet sin separated them. Separation from God. Guilt and guilty feelings before God. Misery and emptiness. Destruction and disunity in relationship. Number five, the lowering of moral standards. I mean, you don't have a conviction. You start to get complacent. You start to get sentimental. And you lower your standards. Number six, you start to compromise doctrine, the Word of God. I've seen Christians, when they get into sin, stop believing in hell. 
They stop believing you got to be a disciple to be saved. They stop believing you got to be baptized to be saved. Because they want to find some justification for where they stand with God. Number seven. There's a loss of moral authority. And people stop respecting you because of your life. And number eight. There is spiritual death. You are condemned to hell for eternity. That's the impact for David of one night of stupid, thoughtless sin. It destroyed his peace. On the other hand, we find that David was unique in his understanding of the forgiveness of God. We find this in verse 15. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. Now, you remember, right before this time, David gets humble before God. He says, I have sinned against God. And then Nathan says, you are forgiven. And so we just got to believe at that point, God forgave him. And when God forgives you, you feel awesome, do you not? I mean, there's an incredible peace inside of you. And yet, sometimes as disciples, we don't understand that even after we've been forgiven of our sins, there's still consequences to our sins. And it confuses us about God. And it confuses us about the way of God. Remember, it was said to David, the sword will never leave your house. And so the baby is born. The baby gets ill, and we read in verse 16. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering amongst themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. And David got up from the ground. After he'd washed, he put on lotions and changed his clothes and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His servants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him. But he will not return to me. Right here, David's actions totally perplexed all the people at the palace. I mean, yes, he was distraught while the kid was ill. He was pleading to God. He was fasting. I mean, he was literally lying on the ground. He was so distraught that even when the elders tried to pick him up, he wouldn't leave from praying. He wouldn't eat anything. He wouldn't do anything. He just prayed to God. And then he kind of felt the vibration. You know, you can always feel the vibration of bad news, can't you? Because we're spiritual beings. And we live in a spiritual world. And we have an understanding, whether we fully understand it or not, when something isn't right, We feel it. And David sensed it. And he says, is the child dead? Everybody was like going, "Uh uh-oh. He's going to totally freak out. If he's done this while the child is ill, what will he do when he finds out that it's dead? And someone said, yes, the child is dead. David took a good deep breath. Removed himself, showered, put on lotions, and went to worship God. Philippians 4 comes ringing out to us. David had a peace that passed understanding. That's our first point. A peace that passes understanding. See, David fully understood the forgiveness of God. And he could separate out the forgiveness of sins from the consequence of sin. 
He understood the grace of God. And the moment the kid was dead, he knew there was no longer any reason to plead to God for his life because it was done. God had spoken. God is sovereign. And David totally accepted it. And he got up and he went on his way and it blew everybody away. You see, David had a peace that passed understanding. He understood the heart of God. And therefore, he had favor in the eyes of God. Because he understood that his sin was forgiven. You know, I think back just a uh, a few short months ago at the beginning of this year. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an awesome time, I think, at the end of December to reflect back on the whole year, don't you think? Just to think about where we were as a church and, and where we were as a congregation and where we were as individuals. And, and as a church, the Lord has brought us so far, has he not, church? And we are blessed. And I feel the Lord has brought me and my family so far as well. But I'll never forget my first interactions with a man that uh, it's it's been publicized publicly who became our brother. His name is Robert Leonard. And Robert had been a persecutor of the church. I mean, he read all the evil literature. He told his wife, who was a disciple, you're in a cult. You're messed up. What you believe isn't right. Try to stop her from coming to church. And then one day, his whole life was shattered when it was found out that that he was involved in molestation. It took that kind of shattering for him to get broken. He was put under house arrest. And it was at that time that he humbled on out and started to study the Bible. The very thing he opposed, he now sought for guidance. And it was great. A lot of the brothers jumped on in there. And I I will never forget the last couple of studies to see the open. I mean, this, this guy was so open about his life because he knew it was all about him and God. And then I'll never forget the day he was baptized. I mean, it was incredible. It was a phenomenal time. I remember... Uh, uh, Charles and Audrey, James were there. They weren't baptized yet. And, I mean, everybody that was there in this one little circle, we were just so happy for him because we knew the darkness from which he came. And when he, when he got baptized, he was so fired up. And then we had some steaks to celebrate. Amen? But, you know, shortly after that, He found out that he has to go to jail. And he's in jail right now. And he's striving to live the faithful life of a disciple. Amen, guys? See, Robert understood that day. He was forgiven of all of his sin. Isn't that incredible? And yet there were still consequences to his actions. You know, it's very interesting. At this particular time in David's life, Most likely, he's about 50 years old. Almost middle age in my book. For those that don't know, I turned 50 this year. Almost middle age. And I kind of wonder, I go, I wonder if he wasn't struggling with kind of that midlife crisis thing. And there are a lot of us who have been disciples for years, and, and we're going... Where is the joy in my life? Where is the peace in my life? Where are the accomplishments in my life? And I wonder if this is what caused that wanderlust for David, not going out to war and staying back in Jerusalem. I'm sure that when the child died, David was thankful and said, Amen. I have peace with God. And now it's over. Or so he thought. Chapter 13. In verse 1. In the course of time. That means it takes a little while. In the course of time, Amnon, 
son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Now, we remember right here that Amnon is the oldest son of David. He was born in Hebron. And so he would be the next king, would he not? And yet, he falls prey to an illicit, in his mind, love. But we're going to find it's lust. For he, quote, fell for Tamar, his half-sister. The half-sister of Absalom. And evidently, this, this whole side of the family was awesome looking. You know, there are, there are those awesome looking families. You know what I'm talking about. We'll talk about Absalom a little bit later right here. But Tamar was evidently beautiful. Amnon's probably about 19, 20 years old. And Tamar is probably about 15, 16. And he is just consumed with lust for this woman. Verse 2. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so that I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. Now, right here, we start to see the impact of David's sin becomes even greater. Because David had an illicit love with the granddaughter of his trusted counselor, Ahithophel. The daughter of one of his mighty men, Amiel, and the wife of one of his mighty men, Uriah. And he just takes her as his own and then ends up killing Uriah and, quote, making everything all right. Of course, it wasn't. Now, right here, Amnon has, very interestingly, an illicit lust of a woman. And I think Jonadab's advice and Amnon's lust is perpetuated by the fact that David had sinned with Bathsheba. They saw an example there. They said, well, if David did it, I can do it. And so Jonadab right here, who is his first cousin, Amnon's first cousin. He says, listen, all you got to do is just talk to your dad. See, I think we sense right here uh, a lack of, of moral authority. There's a disrespect. They're going to use David's sentimentality right here. And he says, listen, you can just work on your dad. And just get him to send Tamar to come and fix you some food. And then you can do what you wish. You know, it occurs to me that Amnon was very influenced by Jonadab. This was his best friend. And you know, it is, it is the way of God. And it's really awesome that we are influenced by other people. Right? Amen? I mean, you don't have a choice of whether or not you're going to be influenced by people. You are influenced by people. But you do have a choice of who you're going to be influenced by. Are you with me right here? I mean, for the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who, have, who are ignorant of God. And I say this to your shame. You know, you've got to ask yourself, who are my best friends? Are these people lovers of God? Are these people disciples? Are these the people you go to for help and insight? That's a choice that we all have to make. And right here... Amnon chooses Jonadab, a shrewd but very unspiritual young man. Are you with me right here? Let's read on. Verse 6. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. 
David sent word to Tamar at the palace, Go to the house of your brother Amnon, prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in the sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him in the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food here into my bedroom so I might eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. Don't, my brother, she said. Don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with an intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. Is that intense? Right here, the plan worked to perfection. Tamar brought the food into the bedroom, and then he grabbed her. And he says, come to bed with me. And she says, no, don't do this. It's wrong. It's not right. What about me? What about you? The impact on your life. Don't do it. And he does it. And so often, as with the things that we seemingly want, we begin to loathe. despise. That's what the Bible says. What was the impact? Verse 20. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived with her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all of this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister, Tamhar. Now, right here, we, we, we see something pretty incredible, guys. David is furious. He's upset that such a thing could be done in Israel, let alone in his own house. And yet, he never says a word to Amnon. He never interacts with Amnon. There's no discipline of Amnon. There seemingly are no words to Absalom. There seemingly are no words to Tamar. He was upset, but he did absolutely nothing about it. It reminds me of Jeremiah 6. Turn there, please. Jeremiah 6, verse 10. This is the prophet Jeremiah speaking to all Israel. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed, so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find not pleasure in it. Wow. That's where the heart of Israel got to. They didn't want to hear. They even found the word of God offensive. Drop down to verse 13. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophet and priest alike, all practice deceit. That's where religion had gotten to in that day. Not too far from our day, I would say. Verse 14. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say. When there is no peace, are they ashamed of the loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush, so they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. You know, right here, in verse 14, it says, They dress the wound of my people, talking about the sin, as though we're not serious, saying, Peace, peace, where there is no peace. It's just, are they ashamed of their contact? No, they're not, they're not ashamed. They don't even blush about what they've done. You know, I remember, I, I was thinking about this in preparing my lesson. I remember many, many, many years ago, 
Well, it wasn't that long ago. It was when I was seven years old. I mean, it's just last century. Come on, guys. And uh, I'd gone over, uh, my family had been invited on over to my dad's boss. And uh, he, he had a son that was exactly my age. And, you know, we were just messing around, just playing tag, just running wild. We've been told not to run in a house, but you know how that is. So what are we doing? Running in the house. You know what I'm talking about? All of a sudden, and I, I remember it just like it was a videotape. I slipped on the rug. And then from there, have you ever seen the movies where everything goes slow motion? In slow motion, I see my head moving towards this piece of furniture. Right the corner, a sharp corner. It's going like this, you know. And I go, whoa. And, back, you know. and it, you know, if you've ever even nicked yourself shaving, some of you young guys haven't done that yet. But anyway, uh, you know how profusely your, 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 your face bleeds. Well, I, I cut a cut right above my eyebrow. And I look down. It's just all down here. We're, we're in their, their dining room, their good rug. It's got blood all over it. And I'm telling my friend, I said, listen, I tell you what, let's just get a Band-Aid and we just put it right here and we won't say anything. Well, I guess I freaked him out. He just, he just went out there screaming. I guess blood was all over my face, you know. Well, they took me to a doctor. I had just seven stitches. And I, and I think about that. You know, sometimes that's how we treat our sin. Oh, let's just put a little Band-Aid on it, and we're just dripping with blood all over. We're all messed up. We're messing up our home. We're messing up the rug. Or maybe we just felt we were in trouble. Say, okay, let me just get a Band-Aid right there for your head. And, you know, of course, the analogy is clear right here. Is that, and our second point is, peace, peace, where there is no peace. We cannot deal with our own sin lightly. We have to be open. We have to be humble. Now, get this. A lot of times we get into the trap of David. We think, well, I have sinned. I have sinned grossly before the Lord. I have sinned more grossly than what this verse is. What right do I have to speak? But see, that's not an understanding of the grace of God. Once you've been forgiven of God, here's the promise. God not only forgives, He forgets. Is that awesome? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's going to be, I don't know about you, I'm looking forward to heaven. How about you guys? Amen? And, you know, when you get on up there and you go, you know, Peter's at the, the gate there and you go, Hey, do you, do you see the, the name Chip McKean in there? In the book of life? Let me see. There it is. Oh, awesome. And, you know, I don't know. I don't care how good of a Christian you've been or how bad of one. I could see, you know, at least I could picture me going up to the Lord and uh, just meeting him for the first time up there in heaven and just being really humbled out by his awesome perfection and sinlessness and glory. And I... Paul, and he said, Lord, I am just so sorry for all of my lust and my anger and my immorality and, and all my... He says, what are you talking about? I said, well, back on earth, I, I had a lot of anger and lust, and, and I did that before as a Christian, and I did it after I was a Christian, and I just feel terrible about it. What are you talking about? I said, you don't remember? He says, no. I said, well, let's just forget about it then. That's how it's going to be up in heaven. Does that fire you up to be in heaven with God? That's going to forget all of your sins? But you see, once we have that forgiveness of God, it's not that we're so morally righteous that now we can confront our brother for their sin. No. It's because we love God. And because we love them, that we're going to say, bro, you're sin here. Or, bro, I sinned there in the past. Amen. It was wicked. But, my brother, you can't go there. It'll take you away from God. See, that's what it means to love God. To love God is to talk to our brothers and sisters about what's not right. Now, I, guess, I just got to ask some tough questions. You know, when you get the Christmas break... 
I mean, everybody's been looking forward to a little rest, but sometimes we take a little Christmas break from the Lord, right? You know, I hope during the fellowship day we, we talk about our quiet times. Bro, how's your quiet times been? Oh, you haven't been having them every day. How's it been you reaching out? Maybe it's to your family or maybe to your friend. How's the evangelism? Well, I haven't been doing that. And you can go, well, you know, well, amen. Or you can go, you know, bro, that's just not good. That's not good. That's not right. Now, I did that last Christmas break, and it led me into a bunch of sin. What am I saying? But we have got to be a people that love God enough and understand God like David. David understood once he was forgiven, he was at peace with God. There were still consequences to his sin. Now, right here, though, we find that David never says a word. He was furious about the sin, but he doesn't take action. And it has huge ramifications. Let's get back to 2 Samuel. We find in the latter part of chapter 13 that Absalom has a dinner party. And he invites all the king's brothers to come. But he sets a trap for Amnon. Now, we must remember this. I believe that Absalom was totally consumed with retribution and vengeance upon Amnon. And so to speak, his act deserved death. But I think there was more to it. You see, Amnon was the first child of David. Absalom was the third child. But all the commentators say the second child must have died young because he's never mentioned except at birth. And so in some ways of speaking, Absalom now moves into the second position to succeed David. And so, yes, he's upset at Amnon. Yes, Amnon deserved death. Yes, Amnon raped his sister. But we must remember that only Amnon stood between him and the crown of Israel. And so right here we find that Amnon is slayed at that dinner party. Now what happens is rumors get out that all of David's sons are killed. Well, we find right here we re-meet up with Jehonadab and we read this in verse 35. Jehonadab said to the king, See, the king's sons are here. It's happened just as your servant said. As he finished speaking, the king's son came in, wailing loudly. The king, too, and all of his servants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled and went to Tamal, son of Amalud, the king of Geshar. But King David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom fled and went to Geshar, he stayed there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. Right here, we find that because David sinned with Bathsheba, it gave, in the mind of Amnon, moral license to sin with Tamar. And then it stopped David, in his own mind, from confronting Amnon with, I mean, after all, he was the next king, with confronting the sin. And now, the impact of it, his sin just continues to spread, and the prophecies become even more true. The sword will never Leave the house of David. Amen? 2 Samuel chapter 14. We find right here, and our third point is an uneasy peace. You know, so often we just hope that everything's going to be all right. But we just have this uneasy feeling inside. The reason for that is, Sin has not been totally dealt with. Sin has not been totally dealt with. We find in the first part of chapter 14 that Joab has a heart for Absalom. And he actually has a bit of a heart for David because he sees that David is just longing to be with Absalom. And probably in the mind of David, he goes, well, Amnon deserved to die. And yes, I probably should forgive Absalom But it's so hard. He killed the son that was going to take the kingdom. But on the other hand, he was right to do it. And so, 
Believe it or not, Joab gets this wise woman from his hometown of Tekoa to tell David another story. David was always a sucker for stories right there. And you can go back and read it. It's, it's, it's pretty powerful. But the end of the story results in David realizing in his own mind that he should bring Absalom back home. Let's pick it up in verse 23. Then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king said, he must not, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. So there's probably still something inside of the heart of David. Don't you pick that up right there? Now look at this. Verse 25. In all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. Now, that's not for any of us brothers in here, is it? Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair from time to time. When it became too heavy for him, he would weigh it. And the weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard. That's five pounds. I mean, what they're saying right here, this is the Brad Pitt of the Old Testament right here. It says he's got kind of like Andre Agassi type hair in the olden days. And, you know, can you imagine it? Just this heavy schlock of hair. Just, I mean, the guy. I mean, amazing. I mean, you got the looks of Brad Pitt, and then you got the hair to go with it. That's incredible. I mean, this guy was utterly breathtaking. I mean, you say, behold a king. Behold a king. Now, we'll find out more about Absalom's hair later. Verse 27, three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. The daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. You know, we know that in the next few verses, Absalom's, so to speak, going to be turning to the dark side. And yet, I think we learned something in this passage. There was a nobility in Absalom. Say what you will about his ungodly ambition. But there was a nobility to take care of his sister. There was a nobility to avenge his sister and then to honor his sister. I mean, he, he called his only daughter Tamar. You know, that tells me something. That tells me Absalom, who turns out to be one of the most wicked of kings, wasn't all bad. And David, who the Bible calls a man after... God's own heart certainly wasn't all good. Maybe that means that all of us have a little David and a little Absalom in us. Maybe that means that all of us have good and bad in us. And it's a matter of choice on whether or not we will fulfill the destiny of For which we were born. We read on now. And we find this. In verse 33. So Joab went to the king and told him this. Then the king summoned Absalom. And he came in and bowed down with his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. They're back together. David has forgiven. Amen. Let's read on. In the course of time. There it is again. Amen. Okay. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses with 50 men to run ahead of him. Now you talk about spotting Absalom. I mean, this dude, he got himself, so to speak, some wheels. He got this cranking chariot. He had some horses right out front. And then, I mean, just to to sparkle up his entrance... He had 50 guys running in front of him saying, here comes Absalom. Here comes Absalom. I mean, talk about an entrance. Amen. I mean, that was an entrance. And every knew, everybody knew about Absalom's handsomeness. And now the glory of his entrance. Verse 2. He would get up early. Oh, wow. This guy was disciplined. This guy was purposed. 
he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what, what, what town are you from? He'd answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there's no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed a judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that he gets justice. Do you see how he begins to undermine authority? He has, quote, a better idea. And look at the way that he begins to work in people's lives. Verse 5. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved this way towards all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. I mean, this guy, not only was he impressive to look at, not only did he make an impressive entrance with those wheels, this guy knew how to motivate men. He said, listen, I see your problem. That's a valid problem. You know, it's just too bad the king doesn't have a representative that could really meet your needs. But you know, just by chance, and I'm not putting myself forward, but if by chance I would be made judge, I'm sure we would more than take care of your situation. And when someone came, the proper thing in those days was to bow before the king. He goes, oh, please, oh, don't, don't bow. Please stand on up. We're just, you're just brothers. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he's just sucking those people on in. They were so naive. But the Bible says he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Verse 7. At the end of four years, I mean for four years, he did this every day. Absalom said to the king, let me go to Hebron and fulfill a vow I made the Lord. While your servant was living in Geshar and Amron, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. Now, I think that's actually what Absalom said to God. He said, listen, if I get back to Jerusalem, that's a sign. Then take me back to Hebron. Now, you guys remember, because I know you know your Bible, and you're never going to forget one of these sermons, right? Amen? You know that it was at Hebron where David was first made king of Judah, right? And it was at Hebron who he then was made king of all Israel. This was a special city, a special place that everybody knew that David had been crowned king there. And even David was naive to the undermining way of Absalom. In verse 9, the king said to him, go in peace. So he went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent a secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Athiophel, the Gelanite, David's counselor, to come from Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the men of Israel with Absalom. Then David said to all the officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin upon us and put the city to the sword. Right here he goes to Hebron, and then the trumpet sounds. The announcement's made. Absalom is king. The word goes out, and even Athithophel comes. Why does he betray David? Because of the bitterness in his own heart, because of the way that David had used his granddaughter Bathsheba. David's sin so permeated and had so many consequences far beyond anything he thought of for one night's worth of stupidity. And the message comes. We must leave the city. King David and the few that remained faithful literally left as exiles. I can't help but think that when something of this magnitude happens, that one is not flooded with feelings of hate, anger, and self-pity. 
Why, God, have you blessed Absalom? When I have been your man for so many years, I fought your battles. I repented when I sinned. I tried to take a stand for you. Why do you bless such unrighteousness? You know, very interestingly, I've had the blessing to get to know one of our sisters who struggles with depression. Her name is Brandy Stevens. And last Sunday, after church, she came up to me and she wasn't looking good. I said, sis, you okay? She says, no, I'm not. I'm really feeling bad. I said, well, well, sis, then I I think you better check yourself into the hospital. And she did. And it's good. And I want to certainly express my appreciation to the Vancouver House Church and Cheryl Hunter Morales, who've been over there trying to serve her while she struggled with depression suicidal thoughts during the Christmas holidays. And I've tried to go over there a few times myself. And I remember going over there the second time. She echoed the words that must have been David's. Why, God? Why, after me trying for all these years to be your daughter, to be faithful, to fight this depression thing, Why am I not blessed like the people that I see all around me? The unrighteous people. People that aren't trying to love you, God. People that aren't trying to do what is right. Why, God, am I not blessed like them? And I said, sis, let's turn to a scripture. Let's go to Psalm 73. And I shared this scripture with Brandy. And I share it with all of you because I think that any faithful disciple, sometimes we get to a low point in our lives and go, God, why don't I have the blessings that the wicked have? And so I read this scripture to her. Verse 1 says, Surely God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I would nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Have you ever been there? You see these arrogant people and their unbelievable prosperity. And here you are just barely clinging on to your faith. They have no struggles. I mean, look at verse 4. I mean, we really get to that point thinking non-Christians have no struggles. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. We envy those people that are awesome athletes. We envy those people that seemingly have no struggles of health, no struggles of weight. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued with human ills. Therefore, pride is their nakedness. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts come iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven. I mean, some of these people actually think they're saved. I mean, on top of having everything, they go, I'm all right with God. And their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? I mean, they just go, does God really know what's going on in my life? There are no consequences to my life, to my sin. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. Who has not thought that? So, man, they don't have to go to all the church services. They don't have the burden of being a disciple. The burden of being pure. The burden of sharing your faith. The burden of having having to study the Bible and get up an extra half an hour early. These cotton-picking non-Christians, they're always carefree. They just have it so awesome. And besides that, they're increasing in wealth too. They're the ones getting the promotions at work. Look at this. Haven't you felt this? Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. In vain I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. That's how we feel. I mean, God, you just beat me down, beat me down, beat me down. 
Verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. You know, one of the things that I, that I do is, at the end of every year, I like buying these magazines that highlight the year. I mean, so much happens in the world in one year. And the other day, I was at the, the grocery store, and I saw the People magazine that was the highlight of the year. And so I was going, oh, okay, I'll get it this, this year. Instead of time, I'll get People. Anyway. And I looked into it, and I just flipped open to it just haphazardly. And I got to the section of where all the people that died this year, that were famous, that had everything, died. Yasser Arafat, the most powerful man in the Palestine Liberation Front. Ronald Reagan, President of the United States. You can't crank too much higher than that. And he's a movie star to boot. Well, some people think so. <laughs> Estee Lauder. I mean, this woman, she was beautiful herself, but her job was just to make other women beautiful. That was all she did. I want to make you beautiful, and you beautiful, and you beautiful. Because that's all it counts as being beautiful. <laughs> She's dead. Tug McGraw. 59 years old. Awesome pitcher. Two World Series titles, guys. Who of you can boast of that? Marlon Brando. Some say the most awesome American actor. And Christopher Reeves. What a heartthrob. This is one I know all you guys know. Johnny Raymond. Father. Punk music. Dead. 55. ODB. Because we can't say his real name. Rapper. For you old folks. Dead. 35 years old. Had it all. Had the, had the jewelry thing happening. Had, the, had all the girls. Had it all going. Pat Tillman. Star in the NFL who gave it up to fight in Iraq, killed by friendly fire at 27 years old. People magazine said as of the middle of December, this year alone, 831 guys and gals have died in Iraq. And they listed everybody's name that had died, at all 831, and their ages. And there were so many 18-year-olds, so many 19-year-olds, so many 21-years-old. It was shocking. Their life is over. And, you know, I, I think back to the, the Scripture. As disciples, we just feel so sorry for ourselves. And a lot of times, where we're at in life is because of the consequence of our sin. And we get jealous of people in the world. What shook up Asaph, who is the music man for David? What shook him up? It's when he came into the sanctuary of God. In our vernacular, when he got to church. And he got to see how awesome it was to love God. To be numbered among the people of God. To know the joys and the blessings of God. You know, a lot of Christians get sidetracked because they want the blessings of God more than God. And in Genesis 15, God just tells Abraham, I am your very great reward. It's just flat awesome enough that you have me. That you have me. I'm all that you need. In the midst of all that's happening to you, I'm all that you need. 
Read on in chapter 73 right here. 21. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. And whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. In the midst of all the Christmas glitz, in the midst of all of your window shopping, all that we should desire as disciples is God. Look at the end of it. Verse 27. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. You know when you get evangelistic? It's when you flat appreciate you got God. That's when you're evangelistic. Not because you have to. Because you just go, I've got everything that counts. Because in the great scheme of things, nothing else does. That's why I love coming to church. I love seeing all you guys. It gets my heart going. It gets it pumped up. I mean, you are my family. You are my reminder that God is my very great reward. Brandy's doing better. Amen? And yet we still need to be praying for her. And perhaps there are others out there that suffer with depression at this time of year. Be open and, and, and we'll help you to the best of our ability. But you know, I'm reminded many years ago of a young man named Garrett Jin who went early on to our church in Tokyo just after it was planted. And when he went, it caused his mother to persecute the church. I mean, all the stuff you read, like all the bad attitude stuff on the Internet, I mean, that's what she was reading. Back in those days, it wasn't by Internet. These thick little booklets. Talk about the church. was a cult. It was brainwashing. Too narrow of doctrine. <laughs> all this stuff. And she believed it all. Why? Because it's in print. Well, you know, Garrett was faithful. And he went to Tokyo, got married there, and then after a couple of years, she was stricken with cancer. Suddenly. He came back. I guess he spent, I forget now, a month, six weeks with her. And studied with her. And that very thing that, that she hated, she saw as her hope. And she got baptized. And the Lord allowed Garrett to be there at the very last moments before she passed. And she was just barely coherent. And she was in her hospital bed. And Garrett leaned on down to her. And he said, Mom, heaven is waiting for you. And evidently a big smile came to her face. And she said, I'll be waiting for you. And then Garrett, knowing that he was going to have to do the funeral, he says, Mom, what do you want me to say to everybody that's come? He says, you just tell them, I'm a baptized disciple, and that's all that they need to. And she's in heaven now. You know, there's an uneasy peace that all Christians feel. Because in this world, we don't have peace. But don't get sucked into the satanic visions that have been trying to allure you the last several weeks called Christmas. Don't get allured by these perfect-looking people on TV that offer you health and vitality and happiness by drinking or by sex. Don't get sucked in. That's not where happiness is. You see, your life, it's all about you and God. That's what Brandy understands, and she's getting better. That's what David understood. And that's why he's a man after God's own heart. 
And so today, God grants peace on earth to men and women on whom his favor rests. And when you walk out of here today, you could be at peace. You say, but I got this problem. I got that bill. I got this. No, no. You're not going to have peace in this world. We're talking about peace in your heart with God. Next week, January 2nd, 2005, we'll pick up the action in chapter 15, and we'll have the lesson entitled, The Return of the King. Thanks, and God bless.